Welcome to the Houdini Hulai Challenge series. So, Side Effects is holding a 31 day challenge where artists create a piece per day based on a daily topic. I've decided to take on the challenge and record each day's work so that you can see the process. I'm doing this so that I can challenge myself and I'd recommend that you do the same. So, let's get straight into it. Yo, so today is day 14. Um, scales. What I'm thinking is not really related to this. It's related to feathers. What I want is to make feathers really good. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of sacrificing scales and draw so that I can work a little bit longer on feathers. Chances are I'm still going to end up overworking scales and draw, but the attempt will be to win feathers. I just mostly want another attempt at fur. So I'm going to use Houdini's guide systems for that. So yeah, so as I was saying, scales and draw, kind of sacrificing them, but let's, uh, let's go for it. All right, this is after the video has been recorded. I'm going to take you through the setup. So I'm I'm not going to waste too much time with this one. It's um, not the most interesting setup. Originally, it was going to be kind of cool. I like the idea that, that I originally had. So I actually do have a left or a right, right wing setup. Yeah, so I have another wing over here. It's not animated or anything, but there is another wing. The idea was that this egg shakes, right? And it's like very epic lighting, maybe. You know, very Game of Thrones-esque. One wing like pops out and then another one breaks out and then he starts like furiously flapping. You, you expect the, 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 the little dragon to come out of the egg but he does it, right? He starts flapping while the egg's still on him and then the egg sort of lifts off and flies away and you can see that in the time lapse that like this egg was flying around and then I just I didn't have the time. I ran out of time so I couldn't skin both the wings and then animate both the wings and then also the render time would have been, I think, about 12 hours because I wanted to do 480 frames. I'd like to rework this because it could be very entertaining. It would have been kind of comical, but um, settled for this. You can see I got very bored with my naming conventions. This is usually considered like the master null, which controls all of your, your rig. So like if you move this around, the whole rig moves. As you can see, I was bored. I called it the war chief null. And then down here I have like the wing thumb and the wing index. And it's just my, my naming conventions really, really fell apart in this one. So when it comes to rigging, I'm not particularly talented. Um, I just know how to go to the shelf tools. You just go to rigging, bones, click three bones, and then you, and then you do it again, and you click two bones, parent those two bones to the second bone. It's like, it's just, it's, you go ahead and you capture those bones um, to geometry. So over here you can see this is all generated with shelf tools. So I can't even really explain it. Um, all of these things over here are all from shelf tools. Um, not the trail note, I added that. So anyways, that gives you the geometry that moves. So I can show you that. All right, I just that's actual geometry now instead of bones. So then you can use that for the wing vellum setup. Um, you bring that in, match the skin to the bones, turn it into a vellum cloth attached to the closest point. And yeah, you just run it through so that you end up with this. Now the actual egg, I was kind of proud of how I did the scales. Um, there might be an easier way, but I was pretty happy with it. It worked decently well. So I made the mistake of pressing L to lay out all of my nodes and I was just looks like a complete mess. I looked like a mess before, but at least I understood what was going on before. So 
what I do is I have a egg shape and then convert it to columns. You convert those columns into columns for some reason. If you go from mesh to columns and then try and convert line, it adds the rows back. You can see that, right? You have to have this thing which converts from mesh to polygon only with column. So you polypath that. What that does is it converts all of your primitives into a single primitive for each ring. So any connected primitives, they become a single primitive. Then I do some resampling. The interesting thing was this over here. So I do the same thing with the rows. So I do that convert, so it goes from a polygon to a mesh with just rows, and then from a mesh to a polygon with just rows, and then you polypath. Same thing that I did with the columns. Then I attribute transfer the n value. So n comes from the normals of the original egg. So as you can imagine, all those are just pointing out like that. You transfer it on, so it gives you this. Then I say that this is going to be my up vector. So I say v at up equals v at n. Then I change the n value afterwards. So now I have v at up saved, but now I also have this v at n. As you can see, v at n, so just so I can show you the directions a bit better. Yeah, so you can see that it follows the curve, right, which is very useful for placing these. So you have an n vector and you have an up vector. So what does that look like? You have the curve of the egg. You also have this, which is now called n, right? These are the tangent normals. So these are the normals following the shape of the curve. And then you also have an up vector. Up vector was based on the original normals. So those look like this. Now, why do we have two of them? When you use a copy stamp or a copy to point and you have a piece of geometry, so let's say I have a scale, right? So this is my scale over here. How does it know which direction to face? So say we just had normals. So let me show you something. Say the normal is pointing this way. This, this scale will point in that direction. And so that's fine. But what it doesn't know is top from bottom. So let me just use two colors here. Say dark blue is bottom, red is top. It could very well end up in this orientation, right? Where red is top and blue is bottom. But it could also end up in a different orientation. It could end up like this, where the top of the scale is underneath and the bottom of the scale is on top. In this simple example, that's fine, that's not an issue, but imagine that your scale has a little bump over there. So it needs to be like this, but if it's poorly oriented, it'll be like this. So that's not a great thing. You need to tell Houdini what is up as well as what direction to face in. So that's where you use the up vector. You say that this direction is up. So now it knows that it needs to put the scales with this top face facing this way. That's why you use v at n and v at up. Alternatively, you could use the at orient attribute, um, but it is a bit more complicated because it is a quaternion. And so then you're dealing with matrices, which are a lot more complicated, but this works pretty well, this up plus n. So you can always orient something. Let's say this is the shape and this bump is at the top. You can always tell Houdini that this is the way it should be pointing up. And then you can just give it a direction with n. And so it'll always orient correctly. And so that's exactly what I do over here. I then transfer the up and n value onto the columns. So now the columns know what the orientation of the scale should be. I also do this I at geo, <coughs> sorry, water. So I also have this I at geo, which floors a value. That just means that if it's a value of like 0.1, it becomes zero. If it's a value of 0.8, it rounds to zero. If it's a value of like 1.6, it rounds to one. So it rounds down instead of the usual, which rounds to the closest whole number, which would be round to int, or int. That's useful because you can copy stamp. Now the copy node over here has this stamp option. So you say stamp input, and then you tell it what attribute to stamp. So I'm taking this value, which ranges from zero to two, and I'm stamping it onto all of the geometry that's coming into it. So what does that mean? That means that we can use the stamp function. Inside of the switch node, I have this over here and Alt plus E to bring this up so I can show you. Find values on this copy one for the value geo, right? So the attribute geo and then give a default value. So all you're doing is saying that this, right? This input value should be equal to whatever the geo attribute is of the point coming in from copy. Um, that might sound kind of complicated. Basically, you're taking each of the random values on each point and using that to decide which switch value is fed into the switch node 
so that when you copy over, you end up with different scales. You can see that this one over here is the sharp edge. So each of my scales are slightly different, right? I have three different iterations of the same scale. I have this one over here, this one over here, and this one over here. When we copy them together, it just gives the idea that these scales have a bit of variation to them. You clean that up, auto UV, um, I subdivide it once it comes out, and then measure for centroid. So when you measure for centroid, it's basically just measuring the distance from the center of the object. The um, material is quite interesting. Um, there's a lot going on in here. So here you can see I fetch the centroid. I take the Y value of the centroid over here, and I feed that into this ramp, which controls this taper over here. So it goes from white to black. I use that to drive the metalness and the diffuse weight. So as I was saying, that makes sure that the bottom of the egg is metal and the top of the egg is diffuse. Then just a bunch of noises over here, mixing them together. Use that as a bump map. This is what gives that sort of scratched look. So you multiply the two of those with this Y as well, and that also gives you your diffuse color. You blend this with a curvature and noise. So this curvature just gives me like the sharp edges of each scale. And then this material over here is like a gold shader. So you mix between the blue shader and the gold shader based on curvature along the edges. That gives you what looks like edge wear. Then I make a displacement map with a max on noise. This is a negative displacement, as you can see over here. I arrange it to minus one and zero. That just makes it all like holes in the scales. So it makes it look very worn. And then I do another one over here. This one's a positive displacement. You can see scale 0.2, the range is zero to one. So this one pushes up. So what this does is it adds bumps to the scales. Then yeah, you just output that as a redshift material. There you go. So now you can see all of this displacement is done with um, noises so that the egg looks very worn. And this gives the idea of almost like armor, which I found very cool. Um, as a still, I really like it. I like the lighting and the texturing. It's, it's all very interesting. And it's all procedural, which I find cool. So you could turn this into a dragon. It doesn't have to be an egg. And you could use the same setup and it would work, which is, which is always interesting. So yeah, then the little wing eventually sticks out the side. This is just vellum, as I showed you, it's just vellum connected to that geometry. And the wing itself, those veins, I mix between two skin shaders. One is very red and one is like this skin color. And I just use this texture that I found for like a, I think it's like a leaf vein texture or something. And so you end up with that. Um, there's also a little oval light behind so that you can see the subsurf in the wing. But yeah, the end result looks like this. So yeah, you know, not particularly that interesting. This was quite basic. Like I said, I'm sacrificing today and tomorrow so that I can work more on feathers. Anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.